Hello, and welcome to my presentation of Professor Morten L. Kringelbach. My name is Andreas, and this is the neural mechanisms of hedonia and eudaimonia. Here are the table of contents for this presentation. Professor Morten L. Kringelbach is a Danish professor in neuroscience with a special interest of pleasure. But what exactly is pleasure? The Greek philosopher Aristotle defined pleasure as consisting of two components, hedonia, pleasure, and eudaimonia, a life well lived. And these two components are a great interest of Professor Kringelbach, where he tries to find the links between these two. Kringelbach became famous for his research on the role of this brain region called the orbitofrontal cortex. He showed that it was involved in abstract rewards and punishment, but also how it's involved in the conscious objective experience of pleasure. He is also famous for his collaboration with Professor Kent Barrich, where they explained the neural mechanisms involved in pleasure. And I think the reason why I became interested in Kringelbach is because I'm interested in the addicted brain. My dad used to work at a treatment home for addicts, so I've always been curious about addiction and the reward system. So I guess I took this opportunity to learn more about this reward system. The aim of this presentation is to give you an overview of his um, academic career, but also to present two of his publications in more detail in order to give you an insight into the exciting neuroscience of pleasure. And I think this research field is uh, relevant because it taps into the human condition since we all experience pleasure such as uh, food and music and social media. And maybe understanding it on a more deeper level can give us insights into how we can uh, have a healthy balance to the pleasures of life. Kringelbach earned his PhD in neuroscience from Oxford in 2001. And in the same year, he, uh, he started his academic career on the role of the, by publishing a research article on the role of the orbital frontal cortex. And in 2003, he further investigated this brain region. In 2007, he wrote a review article about uh, deep brain stimulation. And in 2008 and 11, he wrote review articles together with uh, Kent Barrage about the pleasure system. And in 2014, he uh, published a paper about music and pleasure. In 2016, a paper on the role of cuteness. And in 2017, a paper about uh, Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, Kringelbach did not answer my many emails, and therefore I have no interesting origin story to share with you all, like uh, the amazing Spider-Man, for example. According to the, um, his major line of research has been about investigating the, the fundamental pleasure networks. For example, his doctoral, doctoral research on the, on the orbital frontal cortex, or his review articles with Kent Barrage. And his second major line of research has been more about the higher order types of pleasure, such as music and the parent-infant relationship. For example, a, a study from 2014 showed that music has this uh, specific rhythmic complexity that induced pleasure and body movement in people. But also in 2016, how cuteness influenced the parental brain. And his third major line of research has been about building whole brain computational models. For example, a study from 2017, they explored the uh, alternative target sites for stimulations in, in um, patients with Parkinson's disease in order, to, um, in order to alleviate their symptoms. And they used these kind of computational models. According to the um, uh, database Google Scholar, analyzed by using Harsing's publish or perish application, he has 277 publications with 23,369 citations with an H index of 61. But according to Web of Science, he has 170 publications and 13,376 citations with an H index of 50. And as you can see, there's a big difference in the numbers. And this can be due to the fact that the Google Scholar uh, includes many more publications and therefore many more citations. Uh, because they include student assignments as well. 
He has also published a few books throughout the years. For example, in 2008 and 2009, he wrote books about the pleasure system. And in 2014, he published a book about emotions. His three most highly cited articles are the same ones in both databases. The first uh, is called the abstract reward and punishment representation in the human orbital frontal cortex. The second one is called the human orbital frontal cortex, linking reward to hedonic experience and the functional neuroanatomy of the human orbital frontal cortex, evidence from neuroimaging and neuropsychology. The first publication that I will present is a review article he, he wrote with uh, Professor Kent Barrich. And I chose this article because, um, well, this, this uh, research field is, is this topic is his major li uh, line of research. And this collaboration has been very important in his career. In this review article, they, they go through the reward system and how pleasure arises in both humans and animals. And the structure of this article is that they first describe the pleasure cycle. They then describe the hedonic hotspots linked to non-conscious liking. They also describe the brain structures that are involved in the conscious liking. And then they finish it off with discussing earlier hypotheses about dopamine and pleasure electrodes. The pleasure cycle consists of three phases. The first phase is the wanting phase, which can be a motivation for a reward or a cognitive goal. Uh, and this can be a conscious desire for a goal, but it can also be consist of unconscious processes. The second phase is the liking phase which is the actual pleasure you get from the reward. And this can be non-conscious objective core liking reactions from a reward, but it can also be well conscious subjective experience of pleasure. And then we have the, the learning phase, which is associations and representations and predictions about future rewards. And this, can, uh, this has also both conscious and non-conscious processes. And one way to study these objective um, non-conscious core liking reactions is to study the facial reactions seen in rats and humans and orangutans when they are given sweetness, while at the same time stimulating different brain sites with opioids. In this figure, we can see the positive liking reactions caused by sweet taste in rats, orangutans and humans, which is uh, characterized by their tongue sticking out. And we can also see the disliking reactions, which is caused, caused by bitterness. And this is characterized by their gaping. And in this figure, we can also see the, the site that they stimulated simultaneously, which is called the, the medial shell of the nucleus accumbens. And it seems like stimulating the different parts has different effects. For example, stimulating the entire medial shell increases the wanting for sweetness. It has also a, a hedonic hotspot, which increases the, the core liking reactions from sweetness, but also a cold spot, which uh, suppresses the liking of sweetness, and also a spot that, uh, that um, suppresses the disliking of bitterness. And evidence shows that there exists two other brain structures that has similar um, parts. The first one is called the ventral pallidum, which is close to the nucleus accumbens. And the other one is called parabrachial nucleus, which is located deeper in the brainstem. And it seems like activating these opioid or endocannabinoid receptors may double or even triple the, the core liking reactions from sweetness. So what are the neural correlates of subjective conscious liking? Uh, evidence shows that the prime candidate for the coding of pleasure is the medial orbital frontal cortex. In this figure, we can see the activity in this brain region. And we can also see the bold signal change expressed in percentage. And in a thirst and smell uh, experiment, they showed, uh, they found a correlation between the subjective pleasantness of smell and water with activity in the orbital frontal cortex. And these kind of uh, evidence have led to different models of this brain region. Uh, a model suggests that it works as a kind of a central for sensory information and uh, reward evaluation and emotion. 
It begins with the information coming from the primary sensory cortices that is sent to the posterior parts for further integration. It then reaches, reaches the anterior parts where the, the stimulus is um, evaluated, the reward of the stimulus is evaluated and can influence the, our actions and behavior. And when it reaches the mid anterior orbital frontal cortex, conscious pleasure arises. And this brain site has uh, reciprocal information fl uh, flowing between anterior cingulate cortex, nucleus accumbens, insula, ventral pallidum, and amygdala. So it seems like orbital frontal cortex codes for uh, subjective pleasantness, but it does not seem to have a causal input because patients with clinical anhedonia often shows disruptions in this uh, brain region. Um, but when they are given sweetness, they still give normal ratings of pleasantness. And this suggests that further research is needed to truly understand how conscious pleasure arises. Dopamine was for a long time thought of as the pleasure neurotransmitter, but recent evidence shows that it does not seem to be involved in the liking phase of pleasure. Since scaling the, the dopamine signaling up or down does not seem to affect the core liking reactions we saw in humans and rats. So an alternative interpretation is that dopamine is involved in prediction and learning about future rewards. However, there are evidence against this because rats who completely lack this dopamine signaling often shows normal prediction, um, prediction and reward learning. So um, other suggestions um, suggest that it's involved in the wanting phase of the pleasure cycle. So it's, in, it's involved in incentive salience, arousal and motivation. Another interesting case was the pleasure electrodes. It was first discovered in rats by Olds and Milner back in 1954. And we can see in this figure where they uh, implanted an electrode near the nucleus accumbens in a region called septal nucleus. And they found that the rats self-stimulated repeatedly. And this has also been done in humans where the electrode is also placed uh, in the septal nucleus. And the, the man who was uh, implanted with this electrode, he demonstrated as soon as the, the button for cell stimulation was taken away from him. And he also reported feelings of alertness, sexual arousal, and a desire to press this button. But interestingly, he did not show any, no, uh, show any pleasure. So the man wanted to press the button again and again without even expecting or experiencing pleasure. And such irrational wanting can occur in drug, drug addicts when they have a disruption in this pleasure cycle where they have too much of the wanting phase, but no, they show no, no liking from the, from the reward. I think one of the strengths of this article is that they don't jump to any conclusions. They present the evidence for, for and against different hypotheses, such as the orbital frontal cortex or dopamine. And this gives the, the reader um, an objective viewpoint on these issues and leave room for further discussion. And, and as, as I understand, their work on the pleasure system seems to be highly influential in cognitive neuroscience and in this field, because, well, they have written so many review articles, which have picked up many, many citations throughout the years. So the, the concept that they bring up seems to be somewhat of a consensus in the field. And, and, it, and their work is also taught to actually the students in, in cognitive neuroscience. For example, it is taught here in, um, at the University of Skövde in introductory courses. So, so their work on the um, reward system has been highly influential. The second article that I will present is a review article on the role of cuteness. And I chose this article because this topic is highly emphasized on his website. And I was curious to know more about why everyone seems to love babies. Um, Previous concept of cuteness have primarily focused on the, on the attentional and the, the facial parts of cuteness. But in this review article, they propose to extend the concept of cuteness 
by including um, olfactory and auditory components as well. And they also are the first one to show how cuteness activates not only fast attentional processes, but also that it activates slower processes in large brain networks. And they also show how it's involved in empathy and compassion. So here are the structure of this article. They first show the evidence on how cuteness activates fast processes. They then explain how cuteness activates slower processes. And then they explain the causes of disruptions in the parent-infant relationship. And then they, they finish it off by discussing how cuteness may also be involved in empathy and compassion. So there are many factors that make infants attractive to caregivers. Two of their factors are their auditory and um, olfactory cuteness. For example, their laughs and their smells can activate fast attentional processing in the parental human brain. However, most of the research has been done on their facial features. So a preference for cute faces can be seen early in development. In this figure, we can see the faces of humans, dogs, and cats in both young and adult versions. And in a study where they manipulated the, the facial features, they made one picture be high in infantile features. So if we look at this picture, we can see that one picture has um, a rounder face and bigger eyes compared to the other one. And they show these pictures to children ages three to six, and they track their eye gaze, and they found that, this, um, that the adult faces high in infantile features were looked at longer than the adult faces low in infantile features. They also found that they rated the, the young images significantly cuter than the adult images. And similar results can be seen in adults as well, showing a preference for cute faces. Neuroimaging data from magnetoencephalography also shows that um, cuteness activates fast neuroprocessing. In this figure, we can see a time frequency representation of the medial orbital frontal cortex and the right fusiform face area. And in a study where they showed faces of um, infant and adult to, to, to adults, they found a brief surge of activity in the medial orbital frontal cortex in the 10 to 15 Hertz band in the, um, after 130 milliseconds after representation of a human infant face. Uh, however, this brief surge of activity was not found when they, when they were shown adult faces. Uh, and in this figure, we can also see the activity of the right fusiform face area, but they did not find any significant difference in the responses. And they concluded that uh, this activity in the, in the medial orbital frontal cortex might reflect the attention and an em emotional processing so that we are more likely to attend to and take care of offspring. And after this fast neural process, slower processing begins in large brain networks. Becoming a parent requires developing parental capacities. And these capacities include a focus of attention on the infant and the contingent responsiveness. Learn the infant to better cope with their emotions, for example, when they're crying or distressed. And the behavioral sensitivity and the ability to treat this infant as a psychological agent. And um, evidence suggests that developing these parental capacities engages brain networks that are involved in emotion, pleasure, and social interaction and mentalization. And they find that uh, a key brain region that is engaged is the Lo and behold, the orbital frontal cortex. So um, this has led to suggestions that the, this brain region might be the key brain region that changes as these parental capacities develops over time. However, there can be disruptions in this special parent-infant relationship. For example, a common disorder is postnatal depression. It's very common because it, it affects um, 10 to 15% per of all parents in high income countries, but also 30% of all mothers in low to middle income countries. And this affects their behavioral sensitivity to infant cues, such as their, their cries, for example. And this can be a major threat for their 
for the child's cognitive and emotional development. And another problem that can occur is when the parent, the, not the parent, but the child is born with a cleft lip, as we can see in this figure. And this changes the typical cute face facial configuration. And in a study, they found that non-parents rate the cuteness and attractiveness of infants with cleft lip significantly less compared to healthy infants with no cleft lip. And they also found that they le have less viewing time on the cleft lip infant. And more interestingly, the, um, the brief surge of activity that we saw in the immediate orbital frontal cortex earlier is actually diminished when uh, the, the, the infant has this condition, which is a big threat for this parent-infant relationship. So neuroscientific research has helped developing interventions when there are these disruptions. For example, the baby social reward task uses cute sounds and faces to mimic important aspects of the caregiving. And also musical training has also shown improvements in the sensitivity for infant cues, which can be vital for when there are these kind of conditions and, and disorders such as postnatal depressions. And finally, they show that cuteness may also be play a huge role in empathy and compassion. Uh, a demonstrating example that they, that they um, present is the drowning of this cute little three-year-old Syrian refugee back in 2015 in the Mediterranean Sea. And this image that we see spread on the, on the internet and caused moral outrage. And it led to huge donations to the Syrian refugee. And for some reason, the, the Syrian refugees become worthy of moral concern. So it seems like um, cuteness functions as a way to expand the moral circle by including outgroup members as well. I think a strong strength of this uh, article is clearly its novelty since it, it is the first to show that, it, that cuteness does not only activate fast uh, neural processing that we saw, but that it also activates slower processing in large brain networks. And, and also it's novel because it challenged previous concepts of cuteness by including, including um, laughs and, and, and their smells. But uh, this is where the weakness comes in my opinion, because by reading the, the article, they did not provide much data on the auditory and olfactory components. And uh, this could have been more convincing in their argument for the inclusion in the, in the definition. And uh, furthermore, I think uh, more research in this field can have, a, can have a huge impact on a global level. Since we saw that these conditions and disorders like postnatal depressions is very common. Um, research in this field can help developing interventions. So for the parent infant relationship. So it can really help make sure that many, many people get a healthy cognitive and emotional development and yeah, make it so that we have more good citizens. And furthermore, understanding the role of cuteness and how it can be used as a way to expand the moral circle can be a valuable tool in different types of worldwide conflicts, or maybe even expand the moral circle to include non-human animals as well. So um, Klingenberg has contributed a lot to the understanding of this particular brain region that we have talked about so much before, uh, the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, so one can say that he's kind of a pioneer in this research field because he was actually the first to correlate brain activity in this brain area with the subjective pleasantness in, in a study using liquid foods. But also he was one of the first to show how the medial uh, parts of this orbital frontal cortex are activated by rewards and that the lateral parts are activated by punishment. So this kind of, re this kind of research has contributed more to the understanding of the function of this orbital frontal cortex, which because the functions were quite unknown in the beginning of 2000s. So this will definitely be a huge part of his legacy. 
And his more recent research has been more about finding treatments for patients with Parkinson's disease and post-traumatic stress disorder. So it will be interesting to see how much he can contribute, contribute in this area as well in the future. I also think that his research can be valuable for psychiatry. For example, in a study from 2015, they, they proposed to reconceptualize uh, the disorder clinical anhedonia, which is common in uh, depression and schizophrenia. And they want to divide this disorder into subcomponents uh, based on this pleasure cycle, since uh, disruption in each of these um, components uh, shows different types of expressions. For example, if you have a disruption in the wanting phase of the cycle, then the expression can be a lack of interest of pursuing activities or, or pleasure. And today, uh, the, the clinical anhedonia is assessed using self-report questionnaires, but it might not capture the, the specific components that, has, that shows disruptions. So, um, so um, physiological and behavioral uh, measuring instruments can complement these self-report uh, uh, self -report questionnaires in order to lead to more accurate diagnosis. And that will potentially lead to better treatments of clinical anhedonia. And I also think that his research can be valuable for like a general so society. For example, his research on the higher order types of uh, pleasure such as music, dance and arts can um, well, it showed that it can induce pleasure for sure, but it can also lead to longer lasting well-being. So um, it, can, it can potentially lead to more people maybe appreciating the arts and higher order pleasure and lead to more well-being or more eudaimonia as Aristotle would have said. As you can see, Klingenbach has spent most of his academic career trying to understand the pleasures, the fundamental pleasure system. Uh, and I guess the take home message from this presentation might be that pleasure consists of many different components and that this long lived myth that dopamine, yeah, dopamine is not the pleasure neurotransmitter, but that liking and pleasure has more got to do with uh, these hedonic hotspots and the endocannabinoid and opioid receptors. And maybe that <laughs> the, the reason why everyone loves babies is, well, essentially because their, their cuteness hijacks our brain. Thank you.